can we hear me? Okay, uh, good morning. Uh, you guys sound like you're going to an execution. Let's try that again. Good morning. Uh, I hate when people do that, so I thought I'd try it. Uh, I don't feel any better about it, so I'm never going to do that again. Cool. So this is Don't Cheat the Executor. I'm Scott Underwood. Uh, we're going to be talking about execution contexts in Scala. Um, to give you a little bit of background about who I am, uh, I work at Troops. I've been there for about a year. At Troops, we're building AI for work. Um, we're doing it in Scala. We're a fast-growing team of engineers, and we are currently hiring. So check us out at troops.ai for more information. Uh, one of the perks is all of our engineers are immediately vested, so first, first day. Um, cool, so let's dive into this stuff. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever had a production problem. Cool, so we're all living a little bit. I know personally I don't feel alive until production's broken on Saturday. You know, uh, gets my blood flowing. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever had a production problem that was related to concurrency. Yes. Uh, now keep your hand up or re-raise it if you knew immediately what it was or how to fix it. <laughs> yeah, it's name here, right there with you. Uh, bars down the street. So uh, concurrency is hard. That's 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 why you can't fix it uh, because concurrency is useful, but it's hard. It's like playing with very sharp knives. Uh, you can cut through pennies, lots of things if you want to, uh, but it's only a matter of time before you get yourself in trouble. It's not really a win. It's more. It's not really an if. It's more of a win with concurrency. So I think knowing a little bit more about execution context in Scala can uh, make the times when we need to use concurrency a little bit easier on us. Uh, level of difficulty of this talk is going to be quite a bit lower than the last two, so we're going to coast on into lunch. Great, so let's talk about the agenda. Uh, if you must perform things asynchronously and you want to take advantage of multiple CPUs, how do you even do that in Scala? Uh, what is happening to your code under the hood? Uh, how is your code being run? When you click run, what's going on? Uh, can I optimize the way my code runs? Can I constrain different pieces of my application uh, to run differently? How can I diagnose these issues uh, in my execution model? Can I tune things with more confidence? Uh, how can I get more visibility into how this stuff works? We're going to talk a little about definite paths to failures, some lessons learned in my last year at Troops, and things to avoid. And at the end, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, further exploration into uh, execution contexts and futures. So let's get started with an example. Say you need to write something to a file, and you also want to send the same thing over the network. Sounds pretty easy. Uh, we just live coded free monads, so we should be able to knock this out before lunch. Um, How is that going to look in Scala? Uh, it's going to look something like this. We're going to have maybe a send to API function. It's going to have some business logic. It takes a model object. It's going to perform the business logic to send to the API. It's going to look very similar to the write to file function from an interspace, interface perspective. Uh, we're not too interested in how that's happening right here. We're more interested in, in the way we're calling it. So what happens when we run this code? Uh, and this code is basically going to trace through and say, I'm calling this function, calling this function, and I'm continuing. Let's take a look. Cool. So you see we have much like what we'd expect, log statements coming out calling send to API, send to API, calling write to file, read to file, uh, you know, read to file, write to file is done. Uh, interesting thing here is this piece of information. So, oh, it took five seconds for that API call to come back. That's annoying. I wonder who wrote that or where that's coming from. Uh, you know, I don't really have a lot of time to waste on that. I've got a Rangers game to go to. I don't really want to sit around and wait for these API calls. How can I do better? Um, okay, we'll say I want to uh, make it concurrent. What do we do? Well, if you want to make the same code concurrent, you would just make these calls asynchronous by wrapping them in these futures. Uh, so what happens when we run this version of the code, which is the same version, uh, just the only difference being that we are now wrapping these things in these futures. Great. So, oh, see that we've called the API. Uh, we are immediately calling right to file. We're immediately continuing. Uh, we're now free to go about our business, maybe buy me some Rangers tickets uh, while the rest of my stuff waits for API calls. Uh, notice here we're doing the exact same thing. Uh, everything's just wrapped in a future. So what is this future thing? 
Let's talk about that for a second. Um, future is a placeholder for something that doesn't exist yet. So a good analogy for a future is an online order for pizza. You order pizza, you immediately get a confirmation saying, oh, we promise to try to deliver this pizza. Uh, we know you want it, it's gonna show up in a box. That email confirmation can be representative of your future. You know it's coming, it's just not there yet. Uh, your order is gonna complete uh, and it's going to complete with either a success of a pizza or a failure. Maybe the delivery guy wrecks his car. Um, maybe you have a pizza not hot enough exception. Uh, things, things like this. Um, cool. So one thing we can also notice about our output of that program is the fact that we see this uh, you know, message about a Scala execution context global. Okay. So deducing that that's the thread that it's running on um, because of seen enough log statements to see, oh, we have a main, and then we have this execution context. Okay, so how did we get there? Um, well, the part I didn't show you is where I imported the global execution context. Um, and you'll see that a lot of my code says debug, and it's because I copied some of the 2.12 code into my own project and renamed it and put log statements everywhere to figure out what was going on. So it's a little bit hacked up. But what happens if I ran without this piece? Uh, what would happen? Oh. Let's try it. Oh, crap. We have a problem. Code doesn't even compile. You get this error saying you need to pass execution context parameter uh, or you need to import the global execution context. So what do you do? Uh, you know, you're trying to knock this out before lunch. I'm ready to do this. Let's just, let's just do what the computer says. Um, this is probably how a lot of people end up using this execution context. They see this error and say, oh, whoops, okay, let me just do what it says because um, that's how we live our lives. So what's the purpose of this thing? Uh, what is, you know, I import it, it works, great, but what, what, why do I have to do this? Uh, what's the goal here? Um, the goal of an execution context is to kind of separate the concerns of business logic and code execution. So when you're writing code, you can be more concerned with what it's doing, whereas the execution context can be more concerned with how it's being done. Um, Execution context, what's actually gonna run your code on the JVM and perform the computation is responsible. Uh, it's responsible for performing the computation. So, great. How does this impact you? Well, two, one way it impacts you is application performance. Uh, it affects the way your code runs and interacts with the machine. It's extremely important to building products that people want to use. Uh, hand in hand with that is your resource usage optimization. Um, these things go very closely together. If you do not care about them, you are going to end up suffering some embarrassment. Um, so that's how they affect you. It's good to avoid embarrassment whenever you can. Um, cool, so we know we kind of need them, we know that they affect us, but we still don't know how they work. Um, let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So how does this work? So let's start tracing this code. Um, we'll first start with our future here. We're calling the future apply function. So what does that look like? Um, and I've edited this a little bit for readability. I've not changed any of the underlying functionality. Uh, we see here that the future apply function creates this successful try of type unit, okay? Uh, then it creates this kept promise. Uh, okay, so what, we haven't talked about what a promise is yet. Uh, this is a new term, so let's, let's kind of cover this. A promise is an already completed future, uh, given its result at creation. So it's essentially like if you ordered a pizza and it was immediately there in front of you. It sounds awesome, actually. To just, if everything was just a kept promise in life, life would be great. Uh, okay, but wait. So we're already talking about kept promises, but we really haven't covered what a, what a promise is uh, in general. So what is a general promise? So promise is what gives you the future. So it's a single sign in a container. Uh, it's used to complete a future. Think of the delivery person in our example as holding a reference to this promise. Um, it's up to them to deliver your pizza successfully. It's up to them to call complete and give you the pizza or crash their car, do something terrible, um, eat half your pizza. Uh, an example of this would be, uh, this is a thought was funny. Uh, this promise is probably gonna be failed with an exception. Uh, this future, sorry, is probably gonna be failed with an exception. So let's go back to our code here we were tracing through. Um, Great, so once we have our kept promise, uh, we are then calling uh, map on it. And what does map do? Uh, so map creates uh, a new default promise, which is different from a kept promise. 
the fault promise is not completed yet. Uh, the fault promise can either complete the future with a failure or a successful. So then we are calling on complete, and with on complete we are passing this function that will take a result and complete our new default promise. Okay, so. Now we're still tracing, we're seeing that, okay, we have this execution context being passed through here, but we still haven't seen it used. Um, let's look a little on complete and see if that tells us anything. Um, cool, so on complete, and remember we're in our kept promise right now, is creating a new callback runnable. Takes our execu executor and our function and is gonna call complete on the default promise. So, it then call, or it's gonna pass the function to be called. So it then calls execute with value. What does that do? So here is a picture of our callback runnable. And as you see, execute dot with value is actually calling executor dot execute and passing ourselves. So it's telling the executor to complete me. And you know, we're in a runnable now. Uh, this thing extends runnable. So we've traced through to apply. We've kind of seen where the rubber hits the road and what does execute look like? So uh, execution context in Scala is very similar to Java executor, um, almost cousins, almost siblings, uh, whatever you wanna call it. Their, their traits and interfaces look very, very, they're identical essentially. Um, for those of us coming from Java like myself, uh, this made me feel good. Um, I felt more comfortable knowing that these were both Java Lang runnables. I was able to start reasoning about how this code is gonna start running and there's probably some threading underneath, um, stuff that I've seen before. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the global execution context um, since that's the one we used. We'll start there. Cool, so how do you use this thing? Uh, there's two simple options here. One is you can import it like we saw um, and two is you can declare it as implicit val within scope. Uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about implicits here. Uh, if you want to know more about implicits, check out my colleague Will Myers' talk on the machinery behind the semantics to learn more. Uh, cool, so we know we're, we have this implementation now, right? We have a, we're using an execution context, it's, it's concrete, so how does that implementation work? How it works is uh, the global execution context is backed by a fork join thread pool. At a high level, what this means is that you're going to fork bigger tasks into smaller ones uh, and if the task's small enough, you're gonna do it directly. Uh, the way I remember this is, this is exactly how I eat cake. Uh, so I take my fork, if this bite is small enough, I put it directly in my mouth. If it's too big, I just take it and fork it into two. Uh, easy way to think about it. Um, it's a very complex piece of machinery. Uh, you could do an entire talk on fork join. Uh, I think in the documentation within the third line, it instructs you to read a chapter of the book. So. It's a, it's, it, it's a pretty deep pool, um, and you know, there's, there's only a diving board, there's not stairs, so it's uh, not to be taken lightly. Um, but at a high level, it's uh, optimal for short-lived tasks, so that's interesting to us. Um, another thing that's interesting is that the fork join pool in 2.11 is actually ported from the original JSR for concurrency, whereas in the fork join pool in 2.12 is an alias to Java util concurrent. Uh, so you might get a vendor-specific implementation that might affect your performance. Um, there is a backport out there that's, that's available for use if you want to use the 2.11 version in 2.12. Um, very interesting point there. Uh, great, so we've talked a little bit about how it works. We've talked about fork join. Let's uh, see this thing in action. Um, this is actually the hardest part of the presentation. This is the triple axle, if you will, uh, going from here to here. Oh, there we go, all right, cool. So. So can everyone see this? Can everyone see that? Sort of? Cool, so I'm going to try to run some examples here. Let me just fire up SVT. Great, so I'm gonna run example A. I like to call my, uh, my runnables very descriptive things, so I start with A and then go to B. Um, what this program is gonna do, uh, let's check that out for a second, so see if we can't, uh, can I just do a new, um, let's create a new window here. Let's take a look at this piece of code. 
sample A. Can everyone, can everyone see this a little bit? What this is gonna do is, it's gonna start up, we're gonna grab a reference to our execution context global. We're gonna do some async work. Uh, I have a function called sleep and echo. All that does is call thread sleep for two seconds and echo the name of the thread. Uh, we're gonna call this 16 times. So, pop back here and we're gonna run this. Cool, so interesting. Okay, so completed in four seconds. So if my threads are just sleeping, I would, I would hope that I could just fork them all off at once and you know, wait for them, right? Um, so let's take a look at what we think this thing did. Looks like it created uh, eight threads. So wh why did it create eight threads? Um, and the reason for that is because the global execution context has a parallelism setting. So Fork join pool uses a parallelism setting. It defaults to your runtime available processors. So the reason my example used eight threads is because my computer has eight thread cores in it. Uh, this can be overridden um, by VM args. Um, so let's take a look at how that would work and how that would affect my program. So we're going back here. So if I go into my build file here and I pass some Java options and say I want maximum threads to be one. So let's see how that would work. Oh, I need to reload SPT, don't I? So what we, ex what we would expect to happen is our program is gonna run very slowly because we're gonna sleep one thread at a time. And you see, yes, indeed, you have one global thread, 10, and it's just sitting there churning through. So this is a good thing to know. Uh, the code you write your, the computer you write your code on might be different from the computer, is gonna be different from the computer you're running in production. Uh, it's good to know the difference in processors. Uh, this can really affect the way your, your application performs. Cool, so back to the show. Great, so we can, we can adjust the parallelism. Is there other things we can do uh, to, to help fix this, this, this kind of jammed up situation we have here? Um, yes, the answer is yes, there is. There is a blocking construct. So because the fork join pool exposes a managed blocker interface, uh, the global execution context was written to allow this notification mechanism, uh, which just tells the thread pool that something's gonna block. So the thread pool might, if needed, spawn new threads uh, to run code you've wrapped in this construct. It's, a good way, it's also a good way to self-document your code. Um, someone looks at it and says, oh, that, that's blocking code, cool. Uh, this is only applicable to the global execution context. If you switch to like a fixed thread pool, these blocking calls aren't gonna buy you anything. Um, so that's also something that's good to know. Uh, cool, so let's see if we can't show that example again with uh, the blocking call. So I actually already have a program queued up, um, and I promise you it has blocking wrapped around the part that's important. Um, I'm just gonna run it for you in the, in the, let's see here. Oh, cool, so look, two seconds, it spawned a bunch of threads, they did absolutely nothing, but uh, you know, it, made, it made my program run a lot faster. So that's what the blocking construct does in the context of the fork join pool. Um, it's generally reserved for something that you're gonna be doing that's not CPU bound, so if you're network calls or reading files, um, that's when you would use that. Great, so I've showed you a few options. Um, are there other options? Uh, maybe I don't wanna use this execution context at all. Maybe I wanna do something completely different. Uh, and that's, that's totally fine too. Uh, you have tons of options. Um, you can easily adapt an execution context from a Java executor. So. That opens up uh, tons of implementations uh, suited for many different things. Uh, for example, you have your fixed thread pool, fixed number of threads, unbounded queue, pretty simple. Uh, you have a cache thread pool, say you wanna do something. You don't want your threads to die because you know you're gonna do more work in a second. Cache thread pool might come in handy for that. 
Uh, you've got work stealing thread pool, which is very similar to the semantics of the uh, global execution context. And you have like single threaded if you want to basically make a fixed thread pool of one that can't be later modified. Uh, in short, your options are many. Um, now is that it? Okay, so we've talked about the global context, we've talked about the Java context. Are there other options? Many of these things have been built. Uh, many with very cool properties that are uh, interesting to look at. So there is a trampoline execu execution context. Uh, you find that in play and slick and a lot of other things. Uh, it's used to avoid context switching overhead when you're changing threads. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on that, but there are people here that can probably tell you all about it. Um, there's message dispatcher dispatchers in ACA, which are execution contexts. Uh, there's the idea of a transactional execution context, which would wrap a database connection. Um, provide some nice rollbacks um, in the case that your runnables failed. Uh, there is the serialized, uh, serialized suspendable execution context, which gives you hooks for suspending and resuming tasks. Um, point being, the, your options are, are, are limitless, right? So you can always build your own. Um, you are not constrained by anything. This is just a trait. Great, so we've looked at a, some log statements. We've seen these things run. We've seen a, a few ways to configure them. Um, how do we know which one to choose, um, or what the one we, if the one we choose is the right one? Let's talk a little bit about debugging and monitoring. Uh, how do we identify issues in our execution context in real time? A lot of the problems you encounter are gonna be in production, and they're gonna be under load. They're gonna be runtime issues. Um, so we need some mechanism to identify them while the application's running. Uh, there's a lot of really good third-party tools out there that solve this problem. Um, TypeSafe Activator is one of them, uh, New Relic, uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'd like to look into a solution that you can easily implement yourself um, and something we actually use at Troops. So, fork join and executor stats. How do we get stats out of these things? So the fork join pool and the thread pool executor, and, uh, executor in Java have some very helpful monitoring APIs built right in. Um, they give you stats about what's happening on your EC's underlying thread pool. If we wanna call these methods in real time to get stats, um, how do we do that? Um, we can, you know, wrap a, create a new uh, thread that will, you know, wake up every one second and kind of call some of these APIs. So this thread takes a uh, instance of a thread pool executor and it makes use of several APIs to, say, to tell you interesting things like how big your pool is, how many active threads are on your pool, what the queue is like, um, and you really get to get some exposure into what's going on under the hood here. So. How do you get an instance of that? So because the execution context provides many helpful methods for working with executors, um, you can just cast your instance. You're gonna know, in most cases, what kind of thread pool you're working with. Um, so let's see that in action. Let's see some stats. Uh, let's see. Okay, so this time, instead of just having a bunch of threads that sleep, uh, I wanna show you a little bit more of an interesting program. So. On C, let's see here. Cool, so what is this doing? Uh, this is doing some busy work. Um, busy work is ac actually, in this case, uh, something I really hate doing, which is the Fibonacci sequence. Um, this thing's gonna call Fibonacci 100 times for a very large number. Um, so let's see how that works and how our ex uh, execution context responds to that. You know what, I think I forgot to turn the parallelism back up, so let's do that real quick. Um, great. And I need to reload this, right? Cool. Okay, now we're back on eight threads. Uh, Cool, so you see this thing's computing this thing in four, 400 milliseconds, it's doing a lot of work. Uh, it looks like it created its eight threads, it ran in five seconds. Oh, remember last time, all we had to do was wrap it in blocking, and everything's fixed, let's do that. Um, so I have a program that does that, uh, takes that async call and wraps it in blocking, and uh, let's see how that plays out. Oh wow, we forked off all these threads, cool. Uh, we have hundreds of these things. Um, hmm. Still took just as long. So 
what, what gives with that? Well, it's because the work I was doing was CPU bound. So I was not constrained by my thread pool. I was constrained by the number of CPUs I had in my computer. Uh, that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, and the blocking construct is not a silver a magic bullet. Uh, it's something to be used, generally speaking, for things that are not bound for your CPU. So let's attach these monitors we're talking about and see even more into this detail, more detail into this. Um, I have a program that attaches the monitor, so we can just watch the stuff run. Um, so E. Cool, so we see here we have pool size, it grows to eight. Um, queued submissions goes from 58, uh, goes up to 58 at some point. So at some point, we have 58 Fibonacci uh, functions waiting to be executed. Um, so our program's a little bit backed up. Uh, we might want to consider offloading that to something else or increasing the size of our machine or making this run on multiple machines. Uh, let's try the blocking version. Oh, looks like very similar output. So like I said, blocking in this case didn't really buy you much. Um, the only way you know these things is if you attach this stuff in runtime and see what's happening under the hood. Cool, so let's back to the slides. Great, so you've seen some stats in real time, you've reviewed the blocking construct. Uh, what are some other things that can go wrong? Um, what are some pitfalls? Uh, you wanna make sure your application doesn't get jammed up. Uh, if you know you're going to be doing a lot of I.O., you might consider using a different execution context alongside the global one uh, to handle it. A lot of libraries use their own execution context uh, for this reason, to keep the global execution context free to do the work the application needs to do. Um, it's okay to do some I.O. on the global execution context, just make sure to mark it blocking. Um, that will help you create more threads in the, in the period of time which the application needs to do that work. Um, it's really good to know that your parallelism setting is going to potentially change across environments. Um, code that runs great on your MacBook, you might deploy that code to production and find that it doesn't run so great. Um, that's happened to me before. It was one of that, it led to some embarrassment, so try to avoid that. Um, and blocking doesn't always create new threads when you switch to a different thread pool. So if you, your code works great, it creates all these new threads, and all of a sudden you want to switch your underlying thread pool, blocking will not save you in that case. Uh, it only works on the global execution context or people that have implemented the managed blocker interface. So that's really good to know. All right, so putting it all together. Uh, execution contexts really control the way uh, your code runs on the JVM. Uh, the global execution context, which is Scala's out-of-the-box implementation, is really great. Uh, it's, it's pretty uh, dumb idiot-proof. Um, there are some things you can do that, that can really hurt you, but in the, in the general sense, uh, we, we use the global execution context like troops. Uh, it works great. So it's, uh, it's, it's good to use, but it's also good to know that you have a large tool belt, um, and you can dip into some of these other execution contexts if you want to do some, some heavier lifting uh, or some more custom things. Uh, when you do use the global context, remember to block. Um, when in doubt, hook up a monitor and see what's happening. Because uh, only you can prevent production fires. Great, so how do we learn more about these things? Um, these are some articles I found and bits of code that I found interesting. Uh, when I post the slides, uh, I encourage all of you to check them out. And I'm not going to go into them one by one, but there's some really interesting work being done um, by Victor Klang on the improvement of Scala features in general. Um, really cool code to look at. All the code I've showed, as well as like a really hacked up, logged up version of uh, Scala Concurrent is available at this repo. Um, I'll post these slides at some point, so you'll have access to that. Um, and that's all I have. Uh, thanks, I want to thank the uh, NY, Scala communi community. Uh, for having me, as well as just the Scala community at large, uh, for being open, welcoming. Uh, I've been a one-year person in Scala, so, you know, Java for a lot of, lot of long time, so long-time listener, first-time caller. Um, I'd like to thank Troops uh, for helping me learn Scala. Uh, if it wasn't for you guys, I'd probably be knee-deep in a spring stack trace, wondering when I, where my life went wrong. Uh, so, thank you to you guys, particularly Will, Greg, and Tomash for helping with this presentation. Um, and now I'll take questions.
the question was, uh, can I can I dive a little bit deeper into how I use the pool to monitor our stuff in production? So what I ended, we ended up doing at Troops was to hook up one of those monitor threads in our application. Um, the one thing about those monitor threads, you got to be careful where they're running because um, they can they can kind of mess with the pool. If you put them in the execution context itself, it's going to take up an entire thread to to do that. Um, what we did was locally hooked our application to our production database and production environment, ran it, looked at the output to kind of determine, oh, we have this call here that is, you know, why are our futures timing out? Oh, it's because our queue is like 300, 400 threads deep. Um, and it was very helpful in that, in that regard. But definitely code you probably don't want to be running in your production environment. Um, most, mostly useful for debugging. Um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put one of those monitoring threads directly in your prod environment. If you were looking for a prod solution, I would, honestly, I would go to some of the stuff that exists out there, like TypeSafe Activator. One more. Yep. Well, that's a lot of text. Uh, what was the other question? Was there a point on the flow? Like, you said the, the output was the same whether you walk in Python or not. Yep. So you're not using the same output. But if you're not, what's the difference between what you said you don't use and you walk in and the threads are all active? Like, what was that exact? Yeah, that is true. No, no, it's fine. I can, re I can repeat it, though. It, he, he pointed out that the difference in the blocking and non-blocking call in the last example was that our threads are all active, uh, and we have a lot of threads, too. That's another difference. We're creating a lot of overhead by making 150 threads that are just going to sit there and wait on the CPU. So. Uh, personally, no. no. Sorry. Sean Spicer, that one.